turning first to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20, we'll read verses 1 through 6 and then turn to our text in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 6. Exodus chapter 20. This is God's inspired and infallible word. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me, and keep my commandments. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 19 is our text, and we'll begin our reading at verse 1. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin." Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of of righteousness. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin... You became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification." 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. And let's pray together. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your truth reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory over all the earth. Be exalted now in the preaching and hearing of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. About 160 years ago, America's United States were divided, embroiled in a war that concerned the institution of slavery. Now, some would argue that the central concern was the right of the individual states to make determination about uh, slavery, but slavery was nevertheless the focal point of the war between the states, and the outcome was that slavery was abolished in the United States of America. And so the land of the free was rid of slavery, right? Wrong. There are still slaves in the United States of America and every nation in the world. There are slaves here today in this congregation. You all are slaves. In our text today, God, through the Apostle Paul, says that every human being is a slave either to sin or to righteousness. A modern lyricist has framed this reality like this. You got to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Jesus explained to certain Jews who had believed in him that uh, what was necessary to be Freed from slavery to sin, John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The Jews, uh, you remember, remember act, uh, reacted to Jesus, what do you mean free? We're Abraham's children. We've always been free. We've never been slaves to anyone. Well, these Jews had apparently forgotten a period of 430 years during which they were slaves in Egypt. And as those who live in a free country, those who live in the United States of America, under all the rights afforded to you, freedom of speech, free press, freedom of expression, freedom of religion and assembly, you might react similarly. That you're not a slave to anyone. But Jesus had in mind a slavery of another form. He said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And that proves the point. We're all slaves. We are all slaves to either sin or righteousness. Paul takes this assertion that step further in verse 16 of our text. He says that everyone who, uh, everyone is either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. And he says to those who've been united to Christ by faith, who have been justified by faith, who have died to sin, 
who have been buried with Christ through baptism into his death and union with him in his resurrection life, that it's inconsistent with their position in Christ to act like slaves to sin. Paul wants Christians to think of continuing in sin as an absurdity because they're no longer slaves to sin, but because they have a new master, are slaves to righteousness. And they're not free to disregard and disobey God's law. Christians need to understand this. Christians need to learn to think like Paul thinks. They need to be Pauline in their theology. And the two things before us this morning are this. In the first place, Christians must learn to view continuing in sin as an absurdity. And secondly, Christians must believe that God's power has delivered them from sin's mastery. Christians, in the first place, must learn to view continuing in sin as an absurdity. God wants you who are united to Christ by faith to come to grips with the absurdity of remaining under sin's mastery. Verses 15 and 16. In verse 15, Paul essentially uh, takes up the same question as the one with which chapter, uh, with which verse 1 uh, opens with here in chapter 6. It has a new form because the consideration that provoked it is different. In verse 1, uh, the question has to do with uh, the fact that where sin abounded, grace abounded. All the more, therefore, the absurdity of concluding from this that we ought to continue in sin so that grace might increase. In verse 15, the question has to do with Paul's assertion that we're not under the law, but grace. In verse 14, and the absurdity of concluding from that that we may transgress God's law the law has no relevance to us, and that we may therefore sin with impunity. Using his characteristic, strong formula of negation, Paul indicates the ridiculousness, the, the repugnance of, of this suggestion. May it never be. God forbid, certainly not, by no means, don't even think about it. How ridiculous, Paul says. The apostle indicates that not being under the law in the sense of verse 14 in no way releases us from the obligation of conformity to the law. Now, in one sense, Christians are not under the law. The believer in Jesus Christ is not under the law. To be under the law in this sense has to do with the dominion of sin and slavery to sin and the powerless of, of the law to deliver from the guilt and bondage of sin. Unbelievers are still under the law in this way as a means of salvation. All who are not united to Jesus Christ by faith live under the curse of the law, the burden of keeping it perfectly if they're to be saved. Galatians 3.10 tells us. But the justified believer isn't under the law in this sense as a means of salvation because Christ has obeyed the law perfectly and the scripture tells us that that perfect obedience 
has been imputed, has been credited, has been reckoned to the believer in Christ for his justification. In another sense, however, the believer is under the law. He's bound in law to God. And Paul believed that. If he hadn't believed that, if he thought himself to be released altogether from obligation to the law of God, he could have never confessed what he goes on to confess in Romans 7. I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, that it is good. I, I joyfully concur with the law of God. I myself in my mind, am serving the law of God. But Paul's talking about that second sense in which believers are obligated to the law as a pattern for their righteousness, to do what God has commanded us to do in his holy law. In verse 16, Paul makes the same kind of appeal to his readers uh, as to what they know or how they ought to think, as we read in the context here in verses 3, 6, 9, and 11. The principle established by the question of verse 16 is that we're slaves to, uh, of that to which we present ourselves for obedience. It's the same principle that Jesus himself expressed. Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin, John 8, 34. No servant, he said, Luke 16, 13, can have two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God at wealth. One cannot simultaneously be a slave to sin and a slave to righteousness. That's, what's, that's what Paul is, is teaching us here. I either present myself as a slave for obedience, resulting in death, or I present myself as a slave to righteousness for obedience, resulting in righteousness. And what the apostle has in view here is the once-for-all definitive break with sin as master that constitutes allegiance to a new master, which in theological terms is called definitive sanctification, which we'll further uh, elaborate on as we, as we go forward. On the basis of this definitive breach with sin, a believer cannot habitually listen to sin's voice and its demands for obedience. If a person continues to obey sin's demands characteristically, determined to live in sin, that means he's not been truly united to Christ, as Paul puts things here. Just as it's true of the institution of slavery, and when a slave is sold to a new master, he no longer obeys the old master, so it's true of the believer's experience, Paul says. Once delivered from slavery to Pharaoh, Moses and Israel didn't obey him any longer. Pharaoh pursued them in the Red Sea, attempting to force them to return and be under his mastery again in Egypt. The people were afraid. They and said that they would have been better off if they had stayed and served the Egyptians. But Moses led the people to understand their new master, understand that they had a new master, they must obey this, this new master of the Lord God. And that's the, uh, the point that God makes there in that 20th chapter uh, in, in the book of Exodus. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods besides me. 
Sin's voice and its demands for obedience conflicts with the voice of righteousness and its demands. The believer has died to sin, and sin is no longer Lord over him. The idea of obedience to the old master sin is absurd, Paul says. The Christian then is, is here exhorted not only to hate sin, not only to forsake sin, to shun sin, to flee from sin, but to come to grips with the absurdity of sin. Because he's been delivered from sin's mastery to a new master. That's what Paul shows us here in the first place. We need to come to grips with the absurdity of continuing in sin. Secondly, Christians must believe that God's power has indeed delivered them from sin. Verses 17 to 19. God wants you, as he has expressed it here through uh, Paul, the inspired writer of Scripture, God wants you who are united to Jesus Christ by faith to take hold of the divine power of your deliverance from sin's mastery to the mastery of righteousness. Now, there are several emphases in these verses. Notice first that the emphasis rests on past tense. You were slaves of sin. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Paul doesn't say uh, you are more and more becoming slaves of righteousness, but you became slaves of righteousness, just as he said in verse 2, you died to sin, not you are dying to sin. So he's not in the realm of progressive sanctification, sanctification as we ordinarily think about it, being enabled by God's grace to die more and more to sin and live unto righteousness. No, he's in the realm of this idea of definitive sanctification, this breach with sin, uh, that work of, of God's grace, that act of God's grace in which he looses us from the chains that once bound us to sin so that we might live in righteousness. Now, that's not to deny the, the reality of uh, progressive sanctification. Paul himself refers to that idea in the very text that we're talking about here. Verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members to, as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, notice, resulting in sanctification. He's telling you to recognize your definitive sanctification so that you may progress in your progressive sanctification so that you may die more and more to sin and live unto righteousness. The emphasis rests further on the change that took place when the believer came to obey the pattern or form of teaching to which he was delivered. The pattern of teaching here uh, isn't a Pauline form as distinguished from other apostolic forms of, of uh, teaching. Uh, it's the pattern of sound words that Paul speaks about in his letters uh, to Timothy, First and Second Timothy. And here in verse 17, there's a stress upon the ethical implications of gospel teaching. It's this pattern of gospel teaching to which obedience was rendered, Paul says, 
in the Christian, and it resulted in a change of service, freedom from one form of service to another form of service. This pattern of gospel teaching in no way interferes with the liberty of the believer. Uh, The believer obeys from the heart. That's what Paul says. Thanks be to God, verse 17, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed or to which you were delivered. The emphasis finally rests on the divine power by which they were delivered. Believers, Paul says, are owed no thanks themselves for this. He says, thanks be to God. God has done this. God's power has delivered you. And we might have expected Paul to say that this pattern of gospel teaching had been delivered to believers, but instead he says they were delivered to it. They were handed over to the gospel pattern. Their devotion to the gospel was one of complete commitment from the heart. Yet it's not an option for them, this commitment to gospel teaching, but rather one to which they are subjected by the power of God. There's objectivity in the pattern of the gospel and passivity in being subjected to the gospel but that in no way militates against the believer's commitment of obedience from the heart. Regeneration assures this. In the new birth, the Holy Spirit changes the heart. He gives us a new direction. He gives us hearts of flesh. He removes our heart of stone. He gives us a heart of flesh, a heart beating with spiritual blood. He gives us a new will. In other words, with a desire to obey from the heart. Obedience to God's law, obedience to God's word is something that is represented to us as something that God does in us. It's represented as something that we do from the heart because of what God has done in us. Sovereign grace is a wonderful and mysterious thing, isn't it? Notice further the passage uh, in the, here in verse 18. Notice further the passive language. Having been freed from sin or being made free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Those who are united to Christ by faith are uh, delivered from sin's mastery, and they were made slaves of righteousness. Being delivered up to this pattern of gospel teaching is the equivalent here in Paul of slavery to righteousness. Delivery from sin's mastery to the mastery of righteousness is is an act of God's sovereign grace, Paul is saying here. And Paul's analogy of of slavery is, again, helpful uh, to our understanding here. To say to a slave who hasn't been freed, stop acting like a slave, is to mock his slavery. But to say the same thing to a, a slave who's been set free is a proper appeal to him to act according to his new status as a freed man. And that's what Paul is saying to Christians here. That's what he's saying to believers who've been united to faith, united in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reality. That's the beauty of this decisive breach with sin, with the beauty of of this idea of definitive sanctification. And I hope you can see uh, that even though you don't find that particular term, you do find sanctification, of course, in the Bible, you don't find this idea of, uh, you don't find the words definitive 
sanctification, nevertheless, by good and necessary consequence, by what Paul is saying, especially here in Romans 6, I hope you'll agree that there is, uh, that, that this idea of definitive sanctification is a valid principle uh, of Paul, and not merely Paul. Uh, once you come to understand uh, what Paul is saying here, you'll find it everywhere. You'll find it in, uh, for example, uh, John's first epistle, all over the place. And Paul is saying, That as those who have been set free from sin, believers are bound to obey their master. If sin is your master, you have no choice other than to obey your master, the voice of your master. But if you've been freed from sin, you're bound to reject sin's voice because you have a new master, righteousness, and you're bound by your servitude to obey the new master's voice. Every human being is either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. You got to serve somebody. Maybe the devil, it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. Slaves of sin are bound to act consistently with their slavery. And that doesn't mean they're as sinful as they could be. And it doesn't mean that they don't at times have a sense of misery and a burden of being enslaved to sin and wish uh, that they were free from sin. It means that they can't be free from sin. It means that they can't do anything but listen to the voice of sin. They're in bondage to sin. And the only thing that will release them is this operation of divine grace upon the heart, regeneration, new birth, which frees them from bondage and frees them to repent and exercise faith in Jesus Christ. And anyone who has some sense of the misery of this burden and bondage must come to Jesus and believe in him to be truly free. Slaves of righteousness are also bound to act in accordance with their slavery. Release from sin's mastery doesn't mean freedom from God's law, Paul says. Galatians 5, verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Again, believers are no longer under the law as a means of salvation. We're rather freed from sin and become slaves to, to God's law and to its righteous demands. The difference is that they are no longer a burden to us. To slaves of sin, God's, God's law is a burden. But to slaves of righteousness, John says, 1 John 5, 3, the law is no longer a burden, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, someone may say, that's, that's all fine and well, preacher. But how do I learn to think like this? How do I learn to do what Paul is calling me to do as a Christian who's been united to Christ by faith 
who has died with Christ, buried with Christ, is dead to sin, and raised up to new life with Christ to serve a new master in righteousness. How do I implement this instruction? Well, in the first place, I'd say to that someone that you must learn to preach to yourself in times of temptation. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer under sin's mastery. I don't have to sin. Unbelievers have no choice. Believers do, because God has broken those chains that once bound them to sin and enabled them to obey his word. Secondly, remember your baptism, that you've been baptized into Christ's death and are therefore dead to sin. I point you to Westminster Larger Catechism 167. Often when, when I'm administering baptism and remind you that you're to think about your own baptism. How's our baptism to be improved by us? Paul doesn't mean that we can improve upon God's ordinance. He means how uh, can I better come to grips with my baptism? How can I understand my baptism? How can I act in accordance with my baptism? Uh, the catechism answers the need, needful but much neglected duty of improving our baptism is to be performed by us all our life long, especially in the time of temptation. So when you're tempted... Think about your baptism. Think about the fact that you have been united to Christ in your baptism. That you have died to sin. That you have died with Christ and therefore died to sin. Martin, Martin Luther used to say when he was tempted, Get away from me, devil. I've been baptized. That's what you need to start saying. When you're tempted to sin, get away from me, Satan. I've been baptized. But then remember that Christ is your chief hope and help in the war against sin. And therefore, be diligent to use the means that Christ has provided to be uh, to, to, as, a, as a slave uh, to righteousness. He's given these means of grace, the word of God, prayer, and the sacraments especially, in order to help you to live as slaves to righteousness. Because in those means of grace, we see Christ. The Word of God points us to Christ. Prayer points us to Christ and uh, His intercession for us. Uh, remember that when you're in the midst of temptation, that Christ is, is interceding for you. And the sacraments point us to Christ. But then... Use the practical means. And the means of grace, uh, we, we often refer to the means of grace as to the word of God, prayer, and the sacraments, but the, the, the means of grace are, are evident in all of our lives. And God has given us a practical means in the Christian community, in the body of Christ. He's given us a practical means uh, to, to, to assist us in becoming uh, slaves of righteousness and to stop acting like slaves of sin. And that is accountability to one another as we wrestle with our de de with debilitating sins 
uh, as we struggle uh, against sin, struggle hard uh, sometimes, finding ourselves who have been freed from sin, yet again listening to the voice of sin and committing sin. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful to give you the means of escape from sin. Take hold of those means. If you're struggling with a, with a uh, life-dominating sin or a sin of any kind, but you find yourself, as you encounter that temptation, saying, here I am again. I'm doing the same thing that I did before. I said I wouldn't, but, I, but now I am. I'm gossiping. I'm speaking ill of others. I'm entertaining lustful thoughts in my heart take hold of another godly Christian in the congregation and become accountable, closely, close accountability. I'm convinced that when it comes to those life-dominating sins, we will never have victory until we take that step and use the means that God has provided for us who are freed from sin to become slaves of righteousness. Let's pray. Our Father, we confess to you that we do not think like Paul that we don't think about this idea of definitive sanctification, this breach with sin that you've created for the believer. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us in our thinking and help us in our doing and help us to recognize our baptism, help us to see ourselves positionally in union with our Lord Jesus Christ and help us to live as slaves to righteousness. We pray for your grace. We ask that you would make us diligent in the means of grace and that you would pour out your grace upon us, that you would lavish that grace upon our souls, O oh Lord, that we might walk with you as pleases you and not as pleasing ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.